morning, church. When I was a kid, there were certain stories that I just loved to read because they always made me feel good. Um, how many of you remember Black Stallion stories or read Black Stallion stories? Bunch of you. I loved the Black Stallion series and always enjoyed reading them, always felt good after I read them. Um, I like Mark Twain. I loved Huck Finn, Tom Sawyer, imagining being out on the Mississippi, floating on the river and all that. I always was just fascinated by that. Love that. As I've gotten older, there's still some, some books and, and movies that I just really enjoy because every time I read them or see them, I feel better afterwards. Uh, for me, one of my favorite sets of books of all time are those written by James Herriot, uh, an English veterinarian who practiced in the Yorkshire Dales. He wrote a series of books, All Creatures Great and Small, All Things Wise and Wonderful. Ended up with, I think, five books. And they're just delightful stories, anecdotes about practicing veterinary medicine in England prior to World War II and the people that he met, the animals that he encountered. And he writes in just a delightful fashion and always end that with a smile on my face. Um, Carol will tell you, I am not into depressing novels. I tell her life can depress me easily enough without paying to buy a ticket to get depressed. And so I don't, I'm just not into dark, depressing kind of movies. But I really enjoy movies where I walk out of there and I've got a big smile on my face. Um, one that's been around for a long time, I don't know how many times through the years Carol and I have watched this movie. Couldn't even guess. Um, how many of you have seen The African Queen? Bunches of you. Okay. I just love that movie. If you're not familiar with it, Humphrey Bogart... Uh, Catherine Hepburn, star in it. It's about an odd couple that meet under very difficult circumstances. Uh, they make this very harrowing journey down this river through the darkest part of Africa. This is set in World War I. They're trying to get to a big lake in the center of the continent where the Germans have a patrol boat going and they want to see if they can't attack that patrol boat. And it's a love story. They fall in love in the process of traveling down there. And it's just well-acted, well-written, fascinating. It was originally shot in black and white. When I first started watching, it was in black and white. And then they colorized it, and now there's a colorized version of it. But every time I see that movie, I just feel good. In the Bible, there are some books that are the same way. And two of those are the stories of Ruth and Esther. Every time I read Ruth or read Esther, I come to the end of the book, and I've got a smile on my face. They just, they just make me feel good. They're stories of faith, as we're going to talk about in faithfulness, of, of love, of the providence of God. Um, in the Old Testament, it's real interesting. If you start analyzing the content of the Old Testament, look at the books that are there, the 39 books, and ask yourself, why did God pick these 39 books to be in the book that would guide your life and mine? that would tell us the story that we need to hear. Um, it's fascinating that, that five of those 39 books um, share with us stories of extraordinary people who are facing extraordinary circumstances. There's Ruth, and we're going to spend quite a bit more time talking about Ruth in a little series that we're going to do. Uh, Ezra, a priest who's just determined to go back to Jerusalem and get his people worshiping God again. They've been carried off into captivity. The worship of God has ceased, and Ezra's the man who's going to get that done. And that's what that book's about. Nehemiah, remember cupbearer to the king of Medo-Persia, who hears that the walls of Jerusalem have been torn down, the city's in ruins, and it breaks his heart. And this is the man who says, I'm going to go back and I'm going to see to it that the walls of Jerusalem are rebuilt. That, that's a great city again. And not only is Nehemiah about rebuilding the walls of the city, which he'll get done, but it's also very much about his challenge in a very real sense of rebuilding the people. The people have lost their faith. They've lost their vision. And, and one of the things Nehemiah wants to do is bring them back to the Lord and restore that. 
Esther, remarkable story, and we're going to look at her story in a few weeks. Here's this little girl. I mean, I don't know how old she is. I assume a teenager who gets caught up in this bizarre beauty pageant, and she ends up marrying one of the richest, most powerful men in the world. And ultimately, we'll have to put everything on the line in order to protect her people. It's a dramatic, dramatic story. And then, of course, there's Job, who just can't imagine what that man went through. Don't even want to imagine, in a very real sense, at least empathize with what the man went through. Sympathize with it yet. Empathize, identify with it, no. Because he just loses everything. As God allows Satan to be turned loose on him, and you see what Satan will do to a good man. It is a dramatic, telling story. And to be honest with you, it's not one that I come away from smiling. You know, I come away from it having learned a lot, but not, not smiling. But these five books, why these five in the Old Testament? Um, none of these people are prophets. Because somebody might say, well, Dan, there are other books that talk about extraordinary people facing extraordinary circumstances. And that's true. Daniel does. Jeremiah does. Ezekiel does. And there are anecdotes within those books that are fascinating and faith-building. But primarily, those books are prophecy. They're, they're, they're God speaking to us through those people. And included in that are anecdotes. None of the five that we're talking about now, Ruth, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, none of them are prophets, okay? There's not prophecy in their books. That's not why God includes them in the canon. They face very diverse challenges. I mean, uh, they don't have anything in common, a lot of them. I mean, Ruth is what we're going to talk about. Man, she's a foreigner. Uh, here's a man in Nehemiah who was cupbearer to one of the most powerful people in the world. And at the same time, then you've got a guy like, like Job, who's an incredibly wealthy, powerful man who's going to lose it all. And back to Ruth again, who's dirt poor, as we're going to talk about. So it's not like they have a, a lot of things in common. They don't. They face very diverse challenges in their lives. What's fascinating, in these five books that are included that focus on people and tell their stories, two of the five are women. A lot of criticism of the Bible today. People are mad at God. They don't want God telling them what to do. They're going to attack his word in any way they can. And so you hear words tossed around like sexist and misogynistic when you talk about the Bible. Brothers and sisters, two of these five books focus on women. Tell the story of godly women who face incredible challenges. Um, these are real people making a real difference when you talk about each of these five. Um, facing the same kinds of challenges that you and I can be called to face today. Um, we all face challenges from time to time. Are we going to trust God or not? Every one of them have to make a decision if they're going to trust God or not. Uh, dealing, with, dealing with opposition. Man, Nehemiah, read Nehemiah and look at what that man has to face. And of course, what greater opposition could you face than, than Jesus in the wilderness when he's tempted by the devil? Or Job, when the devil basically is given free reign to do what he can to destroy his life. Talk about trying circumstances. All five of these people are going to face incredibly trying circumstances. Now, when you look in particular, as we are going to, at Ruth and at Esther, the circumstances and stories of Ruth and Esther could not be more different. One of the things that fascinates me is out of all the people that God could have chosen to tell their story, why these two ladies? Why Ruth? Why Esther. There are millions, think about it, millions of stories that he could have chosen, and it's these two. Um, when you look at Ruth, first of all, remember, this lady is a foreigner. She's not a Jew. 
She's a Moabitess. The land of Moab sits across the river from Israel. Uh, these people are perennial enemies of Israel. If you go back and read the Old Testament, uh, the Moabites will do their very best to destroy Israel. In fact, it'll be so bad. Deuteronomy 23, verse 3, God will say, I don't want a Moabite coming into my assembly unto the 10th generation. Shut them out. Don't have anything to do with them. And yet a book in the Bible is going to be written about this lady. Which, and we'll get to that, but it says something it does about how God looks at hearts. Not just nationalities. Because here's a woman who is going to become a believer. And God's going to honor that. But she's a Moabitess. She's not even a Jew. She's a widow. And we're going to spend time talking about that because, man, that makes life incredibly difficult for her at that time. Her, her husband, is, uh, who was a Moabite, has died. And, and she has uh, no male now in her family to care for her, uh, which was incredibly important at that time. She's poverty stricken. You know, the Bible, in the New Testament, there's a couple of different words in the New Testament for poor, and one of them, tokos, is like, closest translation I can come up with would be like dirt poor. I mean, you've got nothing. That will be Ruth. I mean, here's a woman who knows what it means to face getting up every day and wondering, how am I going to eat today? And remember, she's adopted her mother-in-law, and she's taking care of her. How am I going to feed two people today? What am I going to do? That's where she's at. Terribly, terribly difficult situation. On the other hand, you've got Esther. Totally different circumstance. Totally different story. Uh, this is a young woman of the exile. The Jews have been carried off in exile. She's one, we don't even know for sure exactly where she's been stuck in that exile. Um, she is forced into a beauty contest. We'll, we'll talk about the story of Esther when we get there. Um, here's a king who uh, probably wields as much power as about any person who's ever lived, as far as life and death kind of stuff goes, who if he says something, that is what will be, and it can't be changed. Well, now think about that. What if every decision that our president made was written in stone and could never be changed. Well, with, with the king of the Medes and Persians, that's the way it was. If he issued an edict, it could not be changed. Spoiled rotten. This guy has a wife who's embarrassed him and he's put her away. He has gone off. We'll give you a little history later on. This guy's gone off. He's going to conquer Greece. Man, he's going to take Europe. He is going to take his empire and he's going to make it, it's already world power. He is going to make it the dominant power in the world. And he loses. And he comes home whipped with his tail between his legs down. And his advisors say, well, why don't you just have a beauty pageant and pick a new queen? Oh, okay. And poor Esther gets caught up in that. She's forced to be a part of this beauty pageant. And lo and behold, she wins. And she ends up marrying one of the richest and most powerful men on earth. Now you talk about a contrast between Ruth and Esther and their circumstances. There couldn't be a greater con uh, contrast when it comes to physical goods and so on and background between the two women. And yet these are the stories that God's going to tell us and share with us. Now, what these stories share in common are these incredibly important themes. Both books are very much about faith in God, trusting Him. They are about faithfulness. I can't stress that enough. These two women are faithful. Brothers and sisters, there is no substitute for that. I believe that's one of the reasons why God puts these stories in here, because here you find living, breathing examples under very difficult circumstances and different circumstances of faithfulness to God and to other people. They're faithful. 
they're stories of love. I love Ruth because Ruth's a book about love, and it's just beautiful. And what it has to share and say about when two people genuinely care about each other and seek each other's highest good. And underwriting it all is the providence of God. We'll talk about the fact when we get to Esther that God's not mentioned in Esther. The name of God's not mentioned in Esther, and yet God's all over Esther. All the way through the book, you see his hand and you see his work, just like you do in Ruth. A central theme of these books will be this, 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 the, the hand of God and his providence. Got to make this, this observation. Um, Back to real people for a second, and, and, and real circumstances. Um, I know a lot, how many of you, how many of you are Hallmark movie followers? We got a bunch of you, like those Hallmark lifetime movies, which I call movies that last a lifetime. <laughs> That's but in the, no, no, in, in these movies, I've told, you know, one of the things that strikes me is, um, for the most part, you never see blue-collar people in these movies. I mean, they always have wonderful jobs. They live in beautiful places. They visit fancy restaurants. He's a prince. You know, she owns a, she owns a, a business somewhere very successful. And real people? You know, dealing with real problems, rarely do you see that. And I realize they're creating feel-good thing, and that's fine. Listen, Ruth and Esther are not Hallmark movie scripts. They're not. Not even close. I mean, these are, these are real women facing incredible challenges under very difficult circumstances. Now, as we start, next week we'll start looking at Ruth's story. There's a couple of things that I want you to keep in mind as, as we look at these books, and we'll come back to them because I think they're very important. We're about to meet some very honorable people living in dishonorable times, and I want to stress this. Uh, Ruth is set during the time of the judges. If you have an opportunity to, to, to sit with us as we study judges, you'll know it is a mess during the time of the judges. Horrible stuff is going on in Israel. The people have forgotten about their relationship with God. They're worshiping idols. I mean, it is a mess at that time. And yet, I think what God is wanting to tell you is, in the book of Ruth, even in dishonorable times, you are going to find some very honorable people. Now, I think it's important that we keep that in perspective because we look around today, and you see this country's in a mess. And there's a lot of horrible stuff going on. And it's easy to forget, brothers and sisters, there's a lot of good people in this country. A lot of good people, godly people, honorable people, loving God, seeking to do what's right. Don't forget that. And sometimes we can do that, because we just seem to be inundated with the sewage and we're not told about the good things that are happening. In the last few months, what have we experienced right here? You have seen tons of good people come into this community and step in to help under very, very difficult circumstances. People who love God and want to help others and want to reflect his love. There's good people in this country. When Elijah, remember, hangs his head and goes and hides in that cave, at Sinai, what does God tell him? Hey, don't you forget, don't you know, I have 7,000 in Israel who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Listen, Elijah, you may feel like you're by yourself, you're not. We are not by ourselves. Even in the most dishonorable of times, God wants you to know there are honorable people seeking to love him and serve him and do what's right. Now, God's provision of the law of Moses for the poor and the distressed it's going to be very important in Ruth. And there are a couple of things that you find in the law that I want to mention specifically. We'll come back to them when we look at Ruth. But I want you to see something. Here's what it is. Um, 
A lot of people, boy, you get to the, you get to the law of Moses, all right? Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and people just kind of snooze their way through. You know, they read it, but they just kind of, they speed read. Do you ever speed read through? I mean, be honest. You hit Leviticus and you go, people can read Leviticus in record time. They do, and they're through Leviticus. And we miss a lot. And one of the things we miss, I think, is just how, how far-seeing and thoughtful the law of Moses was. And the way that the, the, the law provided for the disenfranchised and, and the unfortunate. And boy, does it jump out at you in Ruth. And let me just give you a couple of examples of what I'm talking about. One is what's called often the lever of responsibility. In Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 through 10, uh, God will specify in the law. He'll codify in the law a cultural practice that had been going on for a long time, which was this. Uh, If a man marries a woman and they don't have any children and he dies and leaves her bereft, his brother is to marry her and care for her. And if a child is born to them, that child will take the the deceased brother's name. Now, you say, whoo, sounds kind of odd. Listen, 3,500 years ago, you don't have a social safety net. If your husband's poor and you're poor and your husband dies, what are you going to do? You can't go to work at Walmart. You can't waitress at IHOP. There is no social security benefit. There are no food stamps. You're not going to get Medicaid. There is nothing. What are you going to do? It's an incredibly difficult circumstance. What does God do? God steps in and says, here's what we'll do to see that this woman is taken care of, to see that she's provided for. To see that she's not either forced to starve to death or into prostitution, which happened a lot. Not going to force her to face those kind of circumstances. That's a little thing that people kind of slide by and shake their head at. In the book of Ruth, it just goes to show you how important that was. That is critical. There are probably millions of lives that were saved provided for because of that principle right there that was codified in the law. Made a huge difference for a lot of people. There's another provision. Leviticus 19.9, again, chapter 23, verse 22, Deuteronomy 24.19. God's going to be very specific. Listen, when you're out harvesting grain, I want you to leave the corners. I don't want you to harvest the corners of the field. And if grain falls as you're gleaning and picking it up, leave it lay. And let the poor come in after you and pick it up. And once again, brethren, no food stamps, no pantries like we've got now, no organizations out there organized to help people facing difficult circumstances. There is none of that. You can't run by the Church of Christ and pick up a box of food. There ain't any. What are you going to do? Steal and get yourself killed? Or starve to death. Unless provision is made. What does God do? He makes provision. Now again, you can run right by that. In the book of Ruth, that's how they live. Ruth and Naomi are going to survive because of that provision right there. And because of a man who holds to that provision and keeps it. What it drives home is God knew what he was doing in the law, brethren. When he wrote those laws, we read them and we're 3,500 years removed going, well, I don't understand quite why that was so important. Back then, you would. They're critical. They're critical. God in his wisdom is providing for his people in very significant ways. And so next week, we'll start looking at Ruth. And again, I want to drive home. We are going to see a story of faith, Again, of beautiful faithfulness, of incredible love, and underlying it all, God's providential care.
And hey, in this day and age, how can that not leave a smile on your face? How can that not make you feel better about things when you can focus on these beautiful thoughts? This morning, if we can help you in your walk with the Lord, begin that walk as you confess Christ and put him on in baptism. Or if you're continuing that walk and you're struggling, you need our encouragement and our prayers. If we can help you, please come while we stand and while we sing. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus.